259.
Thank you, Chloe. We always appreciate your ministry and what a great hymn full of wonderful truths. I, I believe it really does boil down to this, that if you have a personal relationship with the Lord, then it is well with your soul. If you don't, then you are in a peck of trouble. No wonder we continue to commend uh, the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Well, God, you've already stirred our hearts and blessed us in so many different ways, and now we have the privilege of opening up the pages of your book. We're stressing the word your, for it's your book and not ours. And, oh God, how we need you, and, oh God, how we need your spirit to turn the light on for us, and then, oh God, how we need the Holy Spirit and order to activate in our lives the truth that he has shown us. So it's a process, and it's a wonderful one, and exciting, and I pray that we are willing participants in this wonderful process. I pray that our hearts are cultivated and ready to receive your truth. I pray that we are eager to embrace what you have said in your word, knowing that your word is indeed all that it claims to be, the very word of God to man, inerrant, infallible, inspired. O oh God, impact us with your truth again this hour, we pray, for Jesus' sake, amen. We come in our study of Genesis to a little section in chapter 13, verses 14 through 18, where God revisits with Abram the various promises and provisions and their prophetic. God here revisits with Abram the various promises and provisions which will form the foundation of the Abrahamic covenant. What's interesting is that the covenant isn't ratified until chapter 15, so we haven't got there. The the covenant isn't cut, for you Bible students, the covenant isn't cut until chapter 15. And yet, early on with Abram, God began to uh, lay out for him uh, the, the various parts of the covenant. Further, and you've gotten a sense of this already as well, there is a progression to the revelation of the covenant, which means that Abram gets more and more information. And you and I, I know that you, uh, you guys are good students of the word, and I know you perhaps know the whole story. If that's your case, and you can understand how challenging of a thing it is for Pastor Tom to bite the bit and to hold off from talking about all of the details of the covenant before we have in our study actually received them. So that's an interesting 
dynamic, but there's a progression to the revelation of the covenant, and we have the joy and privilege of watching and listening as Abram gets more and more details as time unfolds. But we already know the basic component parts of the covenant, and they're rehearsed here in Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 18. Now, before we look there, and obviously that will be our emphasis, I want to I want to rehearse with you uh, what God originally and initially said to Abram. You need not turn back very far. It's chapter 12, the first three verses. So take a look as I read those verses with you and for you. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee, and in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God makes three major promises to Abram. The promise of a land, that is the promised land, the land of Canaan, the promise of a seed, i.e. physical descendants. In fact, from Abram's loins will not only come a very special nation, but literally nations. And then God promises Abram a blessing, personal blessing to Abram as we've already begun to see, but also universal blessing through Abram to the world, to y'all. And again, that leads to Christ. How can we not just start reveling in these things? But alas, we're trying to honor the chronology of the text. So a land, a seed, and a blessing. Now, two of those three provisions are reiterated in our present text, Genesis 13, verses 14 through 18. Take a closer look. I'm reading verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. Again, we have God promising to Abram a land. And in regard to that, we begin with a beautiful picture, and I can't believe that I almost read right over it, in regard to God reiterating to Abram the promise of a land, we actually begin with a beautiful picture of Abram's humility. God has to say to Abram, lift up now thine eyes. I mean, if you play that scenario out in your mind, you get the impression that you get the impression that Abram is kneeling before God. His head is bowed before God. For God says to him, lift up now thine eyes. You say, oh, Pastor Tom, that seems like a pretty simple thing. And why would you be getting a little bit excited about that? Well, I couldn't help but think of a New Testament story that we have in Luke chapter 18. And as I read that about Abram, I couldn't help but think of the publican in Luke 18 where he couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but rather smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I really don't think it's a stretch to see Abram's nephew, Lot, pictured by the proud Pharisee. We have an amazing contrast here between Abram and his nephew Lot, where here in our text, God 
has to a say to Abram, lift up now thine eyes. But you recall back in verse 10 in regard to, um, in regard to Lot, we, we read this. And Lot, at no, at no divine prompting, unsolicited by God, and contextually with lust, we read, and Lot lifted up his eyes. Again, what an amazing contrast. You know, the life lessons, I can understand why you'd get a little bit carried away here, even though you don't have time to do that. All the life lessons inherent in that. Even simple things like what should be our heart cry, Oh God, that I wouldn't be looking at a single thing apart from your prompting. Oh God, that everything I do look at, that I would be assured that it's pleasing to you. In fact, we can broaden that. Oh God, that I wouldn't hear a single thing that isn't at your prompting, that I wouldn't read a single thing that isn't at your prompting, that I wouldn't think a single thing that isn't at your prompting. Oh, for God's people to actually be animated by God. Directed. By God moved by God. Every attitude, every action animated by God. So don't miss the life lessons, especially with a view to some of these things being where we would naturally read right over and through. God instructs Abram to lift up his eyes and to look north, south, east, and west. You know that I like picturing things. I, you know, we sometimes walk away from the realness and the literalness of things. I remind you, by the way, in regard to your, your approach to hermeneutics, that you, you are a literal translator. <laughs> and we only accept the figurative when the context demands that. We know that Abram is on a hill just outside of Bethel. He's in the belly button of the Canaan, uh, of the land of Canaan. And, and God tells him to look north, and I believe Abram did. And as he looked north, do I have my directions straight? I live in this place, and I still get confused in different parts of the building. Abram looked north, and, and it seems like as far as his eye could see, land that God was promising to give him. And he looks to the south, and again, as far as his eye can see, land that God is giving him. And then he looks to the west, and his eyes travel as far as the great sea, the Mediterranean, and he realizes that all of the land in between where he was and, and, and the great sea is being given to him by God, and he looks to the east and sees all the way to the Jordan River Valley and sees land that God is in the process of giving to him. Listen, folks, this stuff is absolutely foundational. Going forward, you're going to say, oh, man, this is so significant. Just love watching Abram doing that. And again, the reality of it all. The realities of the Abrahamic covenant. And then look at verse 15. I'm reading. For all the land which thou seest for thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. This too is a reiteration. You know that if you've been with us. It's a reiteration until you get to the very last word of the verse. God not only promises to give the land to Abram, but also to Abram's descendants. 
By the way, again, a wonderful dynamic. If there's anything I know about you, and it really doesn't matter about your age, but especially our moms and dads and our grandmas and grandpas, if there's anything that I know about you, it is that you are, you are more interested in things as they pertain to your children and grandchildren than you are even for yourself. You're in the process of embracing the high calling of God on your life, not only for you personally to embrace the truth, but then also and especially for you to be effectual in passing the truth on to the next generation. Our kids! So you have to listen to Abram's heartbeat as it speeds up as God gives him more and more details about the Abrahamic covenant, and Abram is quick to understand that, man, this covenant doesn't only pertain to me, but it pertains to my kids. But everything that we read in verse uh, 15 is a reiteration. Look back at verse 7 of the previous chapter, so Genesis 12 and verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who had appeared unto him. What's new in verse 15, and wow is this exciting, is the word forever. This land that God is going to give to Abram and to his descendants, God is giving to them and now I sound like Pastor Landon, for how long class? For some reason, he's a lot more effectual with that than I am. I... He's giving it to them forever. So you and I, and again, I'm jumping the gun, but it's hard, you know, I'm like the, like the road runner, and I'm just, all of my... my all of my legs, all two of them are really going, going, going. <laughs> but you wouldn't be surprised to lick. If the Abrahamic covenant is forever, you wouldn't be su surprised to lick if you and my lives are absolutely being governed by the no, I mean it, not just Abram's life who lived around 2000 B.C., but now 4,000 years later with you. A covenant that continues, and I know we still got to talk about the details, and the reason why we still got to talk about the details is because God hasn't given them to us yet. But, wow, you and I are absolutely living these things. And man, is this a powerful testament. I'm going to have to explain this, but is this a powerful testament to the fact that the word of God is indeed all that it claims to be, that you and I as God's people can be so confident, yea, a growing confidence in the inscripturated, inerrant, infallible word of God. It cannot be broken. You say, well, Pastor Tom, how do, I, how, how do you know that? Israel! Again, I know I'm jumping the gun, but if God, if Abram's descendants, if, if the nation, the very special nation that's going to be forthcoming from the very loins of Abram is the nation of Israel, then wow, do you have a powerful addition to your apologetic where you are giving a good and viable and genuine and effective answer to anyone who asks you of the reason of the hope that is in you. If we forget all else and only remember Israel, there is, and the worldling even recognizes this, dear folks, there is absolutely no reasonable explanation for the existence of Israel apart from the promises of God. Man, I can understand why you're so excited. I can understand why you're jumping out of your pew 
very, very exciting. Listen, again, we'll say more about this down the road too, but every single, this is amazing, every single geopolitical reality in our world today is hinged upon the Abrahamic covenant. Again, absolutely amazing. God then, with Abram, transitions from the promise of a land to the promise of a seed. And we read that in verse 16, and so I do so. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. It's a great verse, by the way. I will note with you very, very quickly that there are some who have had a little bit of a problem with verse 16, where we have this comparison between the offspring of Abram and the number of the dust of the earth, or a little bit later on, God will stretch the comparison and he will uh, introduce the, the numbers of the stars of the sky and also the numbers of the sand on the seashore. And the pun is intended, but in regard to those numbers, they are astronomical. They go beyond what you and I certainly would be able to compute. We would say, like, not billions, but trillions, and not trillions, but quadrillions kind of thing. Upon, 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 upon. I, I want to be clear, because again, you, you know, it's neat. We have an answer for everything, even little things. Like this, in case someone is challenging you, please understand that, that God's intention here is not to match number with number. And the reason why I know that is because if God's intention was to match number with number, then he'd give us the numbers. And by the way, just a little secret in regard to your great, great God is all of these things that you and I cannot number, he can. He has. So if he wanted to give us numbers, if he wanted to give us the number of all of the offspring of Abram, the exact number down to the very last one, he could have. And if he wanted to give us the exact number, believe it or not, of the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky or the dust on the earth, he could have done it. These things are not infinite. They are not eternal. God knows the number. Well, you say, Pastor Tom, then what's the point? Well, that's my point. The divine intent here is not to match numbers. The divine intent is simply to communicate to us that the number of Abram's descendants will be too great for you and I with exactness to number. God is comparing one thing that is, from a human standpoint, innumerable to another thing that will be innumerable. By the way, when you talk about Abraham's, Abram's descendants, you have to, there's two sides of coin. You have to look at his physical descendants and also, also his spiritual descendants. And the reason why we do this is because God tells us that's what we got to do. And in regard to his physical descendants, we not only have the Jews, but we also have the Arabs. And in regard to his spiritual descendants, well, we have you all. A anybody who is in Christ, our spiritual father, as it were, within that context, is, is Abraham. We have that kind of relationship, and it all comes back ultimately to the Abrahamic covenant, which we will continue to be informed about and revel in. How could you ever count that? Because it isn't just the Jews and Arabs and the Christians living today, but it's the Jews and Arabs and Christians that were living yesterday, and not just yesterday, but a decade ago, a century ago, and a millennia ago. And not just today, but if the Lord tarries, and I trust that he doesn't, it will be in the days ahead. It's impossible. That's the point. It's impossible. 
to number with exactness. And then, oh, we got to the gravy. Verse 18 is the gravy. Verse, verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, the mashed potatoes. What kind of a comparison is that? Why, why would I cite that analogy at 10 to 12? <laughs> Verse 18, you, you got to love it. Don't you just love it? Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Abram's number one priority. Think about this man. Think about everything you already know about this man, and yet pause for just a moment prompted by the narrative concerning his life. Pause for just a moment to be reminded of and even to stand in awe of the fact that Abram's number one priority, there is nothing that supersedes this in his life. And it is the worship of the one true living God. I don't know if you caught this, but we're in this little section. Genesis 13, verses 14 through 18. I don't know if you caught this, but we actually begin and end this little section with Abram's head and knee bowed in worship to the one true God. How about you? How about me? Are you a God worshiper? Listen, I know you're worshiping someone. We prove that day in and day out. We know it philosophically. We know it, we, we know it spiritually. I, I know you're worshiping someone. We all worship someone or something. I know you're worshiping. But are you worshiping the one true God? And I get to, oh, God, thank you for this. I get to rehearse with you one of my favorite words in all the word of God. It's so neat, by the way, as we hover over this just for a few moments. This is the way our service began. Our chorus team. They, they right away prompted us to be thinking about worship. Saying, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, and worship his holy name. But do you know what worship means? The Old Testament for worship means this. <laughs> to lie prostrate before God. It's a powerful picture of submission. So are you and I worshipers? And then my favorite word. Oh, you probably know it's coming. Do you remember the New Testament word for worship? A dog at his master's heel, licking his hand in excitement eagerly waiting his instruction to fetch. 
The Old Testament word means to prostrate oneself before God. It's a powerful picture of submission. And the New Testament word sets forth beautifully the joy of submission. It isn't that we just submit, but that it's the greatest of joys. Why? Because of our master. Oh, God, that I would be a dog. I can picture some people leaving today and going home and someone that wasn't here asking, what did you learn this morning? And they're going to say, I learned that I want to be a dog. <laughs> we, say, we, we say, oh, I, I really don't like that God comparing me to a dog. Listen, apart from Christ, you're a lot worse than a dog. And oh, that in my own life I would recapture the joy, not just of knowing Jesus, but serving Jesus. Oh, that I'd be licking his hand, just waiting for him to say fetch, and oh, with joy and passion. That I'd be marked by such obedience. You know what worship means? actually want to be worshipers. God, help us. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. Thank you, God, for the blessed simplicity of your truth. Even simple-minded men like Pastor Tom. And of course, it isn't based on our intellect anyways. But even simple-minded men like Pastor Tom can and must understand. And, oh God, I pray that you would continue to stir our hearts. We're, in the end, leaving with an emphasis on worship. But I will say this, that it's impossible for someone to worship you apart from knowing you, what I mean by that is it's impossible for someone to worship you apart from having a personal relationship with you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so even in the end here, and especially in the end, a clarion call for people to be saved. But God, worship pertains to your people. And oh God, I pray that you would make us better at it. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking what, uh, as a dog, what God would say to go fetch. And the first thing that came to my mind was his word. And how much sometimes I neglect it. That's part of worship, is knowing what he says, have a desire to know my God. Let's turn to number 234, or Psalm 234, He is Lord. Let's stand together as we sing, closing 234. Loving Father, it's with joy in our hearts that we come to you today. What a powerful message. Help us to go home and hide it in our hearts and not on a shelf to live our lives to please you. Dismiss us with your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for being with us and for everyone that's here. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>